Terry and Beverly, thank you for inviting me to come along today and, and uh, talk, uh, give the George Marchant lecture. And may I congratulate you on <coughs> all the work that you do to keep the Historical Society going. All around the world, Historical Societies are a, are a dying species. Uh, most young people aren't interested in historical societies and if you go to any historical society anywhere, most of the crowd are our, are our age group. And the fact that you run this so well and so prosperously is a, is a good thing because there's historical societies closing down uh, it, it, everywhere. Now, <clears throat> having, said, having said that, uh, what I uh, w would like to do is uh, first of all pay <coughs> tribute to the original traditional owners of the land, the Torbal people, and not only before them, the Burramal people, uh, uh, who declared <coughs> in the history of their tribes that the Champside area was um, uh, one of the loveliest pieces of land in the world. Now, their world didn't stretch very far in the thousands of years they were here, but <coughs> they regarded themselves as being on the prime land and, and in fact uh, they are. The white band has come and mucked up that land a bit <clears throat> but they remembered it as great land. And I, I, I also want to say that I tried to do a bit of calculation as to the size of the benefaction by uh, George Marchant uh, and his wife. I won't forget his wife either. Uh, I, 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 I played cricket on on Marchant Park uh, many times, uh, not in recent years, I might add. <coughs> it, it, it'll surprise you when you look at the size of me now. I used to be a fast bowler back in uh, back in those days. I, say, I use the word used to be a fast bowler back in back in those days. So I had many happy days playing cricket on Marchant Park, and I rang up my friend Brian McGrath from uh, Ray White's. <coughs> I said, Brian. If the Brisbane City Council was going broke and they were desperate for money and they decided to sell March and Park to cash in on a bit of money, what do you reckon March and Park is worth? And he said, heavens above, he said, uh, it'd take me a couple of weeks to work that out. <coughs> he said, but let me tell you this, if I was the auctioneer, I would not accept a bid lower than a billion dollars uh, for it and it could go anywhere above that when you think that an ordinary little bit of ground brings you You've got to pay 500 grand for it these days. It doesn't take much to, <coughs> to get to that. And so when we think of Marchant, plus the benefaction he gave to the Weller Gardens, we're talking about one of the biggest philanthropic gifts in the history of Australia. And I think that's, that's important. And what we need in the future is many more people like George Marchant. We probably won't find too many that will give the, the benefaction that happened there, but there's plenty of scope for further things to happen. And so when we look at Marchant and, and how Marchant Park has made this, this area a place that many people come for recreation, let's have a look at the, the future of Chamside. When, when uh, Terry phoned me and said he'd like me to give the Marchant lecture, and I said to him, Terry, I know nothing about the history of Chamside except I used to play cricket on Marchant Park. And I said, so it's no good to be trying to pretend that I'm an authority on the area you know, around here. <coughs> I said, I'll have to think of something else to talk about. And I said, well, look, I'll talk about how Champside might become a suburban city in the years ahead and what would be involved in it becoming a, a suburban city. And I had in mind the fact that, you, you know, in Sydney, Chatswood, uh, way away from the centre of the city, has now got piles of skyscrapers and is a city in its own right in Sydney, as is, as is Parramatta. A and uh, I thought, well, Champside should become a suburban city in its, uh, its own right. And I'll talk about that. <clears throat> and having said that, I've had no experience in town planning, so that sort of disqualifies me, uh, you know, a bit. But I thought there's, you don't get charged in this life anything for, uh, for dreaming. And I, I was the guest preacher at church the other Sunday and I used a text out of the book of Joel which said, uh, old men shall dream dreams. And so... Uh, and so that's what I'm doing. I'm following the instructions of the Book of Joel this morning and I'm, I'm, I'm dreaming dreams. Uh, now, now <clears throat> I found, uh, with a few inquiries around the place, I rang a few people in Chermside who know a bit about the place, that Chermside has in fact 
been designated for a long time as an area in which there should be significant civic growth in, in Brisbane. And in fact, the Brisbane City Council and the state government have had it in mind for the last 50 years that Chermside should become a, a, a suburban city. And no one has done anything about it. The tax man came out and built an office down there and Westfields came and built that monstrosity uh, down there. When you look at what an architectural horror it is, uh, I reckon the architect must have had a dreadful fight with his wife the night before he, he designed it. <coughs> but but uh, and so certain things have happened, you know, to sort of uh, make the place grow. Then I had a look at <coughs> what happens around the world to create <coughs> a new city, particularly within a city. And the first thing that has to happen is you have to have a railway station. There, there is no no suburban city in the world that has grown without a railway station. And of course, to have a railway station, you've got to have a railway. And uh, so I studied it up and worked out it wouldn't take much to build a tunnel from Jibung down to the, somewhere at the junction of Hamilton Road. It wouldn't take very much to build an underground a tunnel, which could be the start of an underground rail system for the whole of Brisbane. And if you had a, trains that, that came from the city, diverted at Jibung and came in here to Chermside, you could have the start you know, of, a, of, of a city. And none of that would be very hard and it could be the start of a circle line for Brisbane. Those of you who have been to London, you know, you get on that circle train, go round and round. If you get to get off, you can keep going round for 24 hours if you want to. And I thought it could be the start of a circle line which eventually went across to Wilston and joined up with the, the, the Kelvin Grove line there. And so it wouldn't just be a line into Champs, so it would be the start of a, a circle line. And so the railway line <coughs> would, be, would be fundamental. Now into that, in addition to that, you'd, we'd need to take, to make Chermside a city, we'd need to take all the, the traffic that's going north out out of Gympie Road. It just Gympie Road, as you know, at four o'clock in the afternoon, Gympie Road is one of the horror roads of Australia, you know, trying to get home. And you couldn't have a city with all that traffic uh, going through. And so we need to extend that tunnel from Stafford, where it comes out at Stafford, and have it go underground and come out just at the bottom of Murphy Road down here, and then have an exit that comes off and comes underneath the railway station where the buses could have one, have one level and the trains can have another level, but you could ha have the, the traffic from the city missing Champside altogether, except those who want to come in can divert and around. And that would be fundamental. And if people did a bit of original planning, the tunnel that you built from Stafford out to here, you could build it a bit wider and the train on its way to Wilston from here could use that tunnel at least get as far as Stafford in the first go and it wouldn't take much you know to get further on and so fundamental to a new city be to take all that traffic out of the place and have a major bus stop as well and a major underground parking station you could have a parking station that went for Yonks underground to have all sorts of levels of parking there would be the basis of a city now to have a city also you need a city square, and Champside doesn't have one. And if any of you live in this area, I might be about to pronounce that your house is going to get wiped out for a city square. So if you get upset about that, you can see me afterwards about it. But you need to have a city, a bit like Federation Square in Melbourne, where people gather for all sorts of uh, activities, a bit like Anzacs or King George Square, you know, in the city. So we need a a city square now uh, and it would have to be a place where thousand people can gather to have to sit down to read to have lunch to have afternoon tea to to do whatever you could hold big gatherings there whenever you wanted to and the place that i've decided to put it uh, is, is where the old dawn theater was at chermside uh, just down there the dawn theater uh, where i might add they had the best canvas chairs in the movie in movie <laughs> When I was courting Helen, those canvas chairs were just admirable for courtships, I can tell you. And so we're talking about historic ground. And 
if we bowled over that whole block there and turned that into a, a city square, that would just about be slap bang in the middle of Chermside City. It will take a brave man to do that. But Cham you can't have a city without a central heart of the city and the possibilities would be there. And it could be, have the buildings surrounding it be buildings where all sorts of community activity occurred. You wouldn't put another shopping centre there. I mean, one of the benefits of uh, having us here that, that Westfield is, you, you know, is where it is and people can go and shop there and therefore the rest of the city does other things than putting, putting supermarkets there. And so you'd have a city square and you'd have to have something that happened in the city here that didn't happen anywhere else. You've got to make the thing a special place. And I was thinking that it could be some of the buildings in the square could be the centre of activity for some special things in life. For instance, intergenerational activity, old and young, is one of the great challenges of the future where we form two-way partnerships. There's this idea around that old guys ought to mentor young people. That's just plain arrogant on behalf of us old guys. Young people have got to mentor us as well about the new world that they're going in that is leaving us behind. And so you've got to have two-way mentoring and, and there's got to be an intergenerational movement start in Australia. And I thought that the Chermside area could be an area in which that movement took heart and one of the central points of the whole generational movement could be a building uh, in that square. And the other day, Wyatt, I always want to call him Wyatt Earp, but his name's Wyatt Roy. Uh, Wyatt Earp was the bloke that used to shoot up people in Tombstone, Arizona. But uh, Wyatt Roy got me to have a cup of coffee with him the other day and he said, Everyone, we've got to form an intergenerational partnership. Uh, he said, you're 80 and I'm 20. He said, that makes us a century and we'll call ourselves the Century Partnership. But we've got to have 80-year-old guys and 20-year-old guys getting to, uh, by the way, guys mean female as well in case you haven't caught up with the, <laughs> you know, with the lingo. He said, so we've got to have this. And he said, we're going to change the world with these intergenerational. I said, right, are you, you tell Tony Abbott to give us a bit of cash and we'll get it started. There's another important thing happening in the world and that is the interfaith movement in the world. Religion is going to dominate the world for a long time to come. And the importance of goodwill and good relationships between all the religions of the world is vital. And we could have an interfaith centre uh, there, which again would generate the whole philosophy of goodwill between religions. It's not hard to do because the Muslims revere Jesus Christ as much as Christians do. They just think he's a prophet and we think he's divine. Uh, but the facts of the matter are that a Muslim gets very upset when anyone uses the words Jesus Christ as a profanity in his presence. And so it, it wouldn't take much, you know, to have, to have that sort of goodwill. And, and with the 50 religions that exist in the world, and again, this area could be an area that fostered that as a, as a way of life. Now, we're only restricted by our imagination. Another one is the whole issue of seniors and technology. There's got to be enormous training programs soon about seniors learning technology in all sorts of ways because we'll soon stop going to doctors. We'll sit in front of our TV set and the doctor will fix us in front of the TV set. And so we've got to get up with that. So training of seniors in technology is enormous. A couple of years from now, you go into the bank and ask him for a checkbook the bank manager will say, what's that? I've never, I've never heard of it. And that's an age in which, you know, in which we have to face. So the whole, this could be another area that makes Chermside famous. So we're only, in Chermside important, we're only limited by our imagination in the whole matter. Now we come to where people will live. Chermside can be a mixture of high rise buildings and townhouses and a whole range of things, but it needs to have some architecture that is different to the rest of the city that, that makes it a, what you might call a quaint place because of the architecture. Now some of the high rise buildings that I see going up not only around their sub, suburb and everywhere else are, are visual monstrosities. They're just slapped up so that somebody can sell them or rent them and they're awful. And Chermside should become a place that's got elegant buildings. 
and you can put high-rise buildings once you get all the traffic out of Gympie Road and going through a tunnel you can put high-rise buildings all along that main road because the traffic is, is going to uh, through traffic will go down and so uh, that could become a whole area where, where people where people live but the architecture of it must be something that gets people to stop and wonder. And, and architecture is not one of my skills, but I can tell a crook building when I see one. And, and we've got too many of them uh, around the place. Now, another thing is, this is one of the lousiest areas in Brisbane to find a decent restaurant, you know, to go. To, to, to go to get good restaurants, you've got to go to Wilston or over to Ascot or somewhere like that except for a nice little restaurant down the back here called Bella something or other that doesn't serve bad tucker. The rest of them, you wouldn't send your dog to eat in them. Yeah. And, and so we need to have an area where people, people can go and, uh, and, and enjoy themselves. And Thomas Street, just at the back, you know, Thomas Street just over here, it used to be at the back of the old Methodist church, you know there? That ought to be turned into the Ligon Street of Chermside. Bail over everything in that street. Anybody live in Thomas Street? We're going to bail over everything in Thomas Street. And you make it like Ligon Street in Melbourne, full of restaurants with different architecture, every bit of food under the sun from Lebanese to Ethiopian to, you know, whatever you want to have, delicatessens and all that. So turn it into the Ligon Street of Melbourne and we'd bring people in droves to that railway station to go there if we had that happening in Ligon Street. And we're only restricted by imagination in what we might do over the whole, over the whole situation. But it depends then on, on, on what... A city's got to be more than, than just a, a, a pile of nice buildings and where you've controlled the traffic and you've done things. And it's got to do more than that. Well, first of all, it will do a lot for Brisbane because it will take pressure off the growth of the city. And trying to get into the city now is not a pleasant experience. It, it will take growth away from the centre of the city and bring it out here. It'll mean that people coming from the north don't have to go far to, if they want a city with all of the, uh, all of the things uh, uh, in it. And it will regenerate this area. And can I say, if you all live long enough, once we put in all these railway stations and tunnels and high-rise buildings and Ligon streets and what have you, the, the value of your house might just double if you stick around. So don't say that I didn't tell you, you know, you know that the whole thing is, um, you know, is, is, is going to happen. But what, what do we want beyond that? I haven't talked to you long, have I, Terry? I oh, take me photo. I thought he was walking out. I think. <laughs> You got you got land in Thomas Street, have you? <laughs> anyway, what sort of a city one have? One of the problems with life in Australia now is that politicians get up all day long and they rant about debt limits and deficits and carbon taxes and stuff that's absolutely depressing nonsense. And we leave the human element out of it. A country is not the GDP and how much it grows. It's the sort of people we have and the attitude we have and what we do to create a better society. And so Champside would need to come with all the growth in buildings and transport and what have you. A way of life which people thought it's not only good to live out here because they got trains and buses and and, and nice restaurants and whatever. This is a place to live because of the attitude of the people who are here. That you make sure that it's a caring suburb. You make sure that it's a suburb of goodwill. You make sure that refugees are welcomed here and not ostracised. And I've got to say, we've got some refugees coming to the Astley Uniting Church who are amongst the finest people I've struck in a long time. And there's a lot of people who would have sent them back and they're going to make good Australians. We've got to make sure that we have a society uh, that, that, that welcomes people, that gives indigenous, indigenous people a go, that makes sure that there's a level playing field for people seeking employment uh, and making sure we have a philosophy of life which is good uh, you know, for a city to have. And we've also got to make sure, and I'll finish with this and then you can ask me some questions, uh, uh, we've got to finish by trying to find some more George Marchants. Now we're probably not going to find a lot of people who, who uh, 
they got the sort of money that George Marchant has got. There's one or two that I could name who've got it, but, but uh, they tend to hang on to it. But uh, it is possible for the great middle class of Australia to put money aside for the future of the place. We could start a Chermside Foundation where people left in their wills money to, to build the sort of things we want to do, like a city square and you know th th those sort of things. And that happens all over the world except in Australia. And you don't have to be wealthy to set up a trust. Helen and I set up the Everall Compton Charitable Trust 25 years ago and we've just been putting a bit of our earnings in it all those 25 years. We've managed to give away about $700,000. We got about that much in assets in it still to be handed out. We still put money into it. Uh, and the benefit of that all is that it still works for the place after you're dead. The money is still there and it can still hand out grants after you're dead. Now, there's a great scope in Australia for thousands of people to set up charitable trusts that will do all sorts of things for all sorts of people. And so one of the things that this place could be famous for is that we breed a race of people here in Chermside who are like George Marchant, who give back to the community a hell of a lot more than we took out of it. That's another thing that outrages me about politics. Politicians turn this nation into a nation of getters, people who want to hand out at every election, otherwise they're not going to vote for them. We've got to change it into a nation of givers, which is important uh, to, to the whole show. And it is possible for us to do that. Now, to get this all started, the, 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 the government would have to set up a Chermside City Corporation and give it great powers to develop, to develop the city and to make it go a bit like the one they had in Canberra, you know, to build Canberra, a bit like the one they had in New York. If you read the history in New York, they set up a corporation to regenerate the whole of Manhattan when it was on, going down. They appointed a fellow called Robert Moses and you can buy a book about Robert Moser, they used to call him the Tsar. But he did all the great developments in New York, including their underground rail system and the addition of extra bridges. And he had enormous powers to do it. And anybody who got in the way of Robert Moses usually got injured in the whole process. But when he died, he had, he had transformed the whole of downtown Manhattan. And so it would need a leader uh, who, who's prepared to devote a fair share of his life to make this city happen. And I find whenever I get around uh, uh, amongst younger people that you'll find that there are plenty of potential leaders if somebody will give them a go and if old guys like us will we'll back them to the hilt. And so I see the possibilities that we could start in our what we might call our, our fading years, if that's a nice way to put it. Uh, we could start a movement and back some young people to totally transform this area and turn it into the sort of area that a bloke like George Marchant had. Bear in mind, people would say, where are you going to get the money from? Well, when George Marchant arrived here in Australia, he didn't have a, a penny back in those days. He didn't have a penny. So if George Marchant could do what he did coming here penniless, it's not hard to get money to do the things that you want to do. And we hope that'll happen. Well, now